Welcome to Meeting of Minds, starring from 20th century America, President Theodore Roosevelt, from ancient Egypt, Queen Cleopatra, from the American and French revolutions, Citizen Thomas Paine, and from 13th century Europe, St. Thomas Aquinas. And now, your host, Mr. Steve Allen. Thank you, hello, and welcome once again to Meeting of Minds. Minds, that's the key word. The mind is, among other things, the uh, one attribute of man, I suppose, that uh, marks him as superior to the other animals. Uh, one beast or another, you know, is uh, superior to us in one way or another. And there are animals that are larger, stronger, fleeter of foot, more beautiful, less warlike. But uh, man alone has a mind that can roam across a vast expanse of time and space. Man alone can make a record of events and ideas and pass that record along to future generations. And yet, a very strange thing has happened. In the present age, when there are so many really remarkable ways to uh, communicate, we seem to be communicating less effectively than in times past. Uh, social scientists and uh, just plain folks report being dismayed to learn that uh, even university students cannot read or write as well as they should be able to, which means, I suspect, that they're not thinking as well as they ought to be able to. Now, it might be helpful, if all that's true, to put ourselves into contact with important thinkers and doers of times past. Perhaps their uh, experiences, their ideas, their ability to uh, communicate might stimulate our own thought processes. At least that's the uh, rationale for this series of programs. Now, if you heard the earlier discussion by our four present distinguished personages from history, then you will already have been informed, stimulated, and uh, perhaps even infuriated. At least I hope so. Because we can easily delude ourselves that uh, having our own prejudices rather neatly arranged in our minds is the same as thinking. And of course, it's not. We're much more likely to learn something when we're challenged. Well, I can hardly wait to hear what our four guests have to say, and I have the impression they can hardly wait to uh, question each other. Good evening, Your Majesty. Well, I was just about to ask Her Majesty how she met Mark Anthony. Well, now that can wait, Mr. President, because I was just about to ask you how you developed your dynamic personality. <laughs> thank you, Your Majesty. Well, I had my father to thank for that, you see. When I was just a young boy, I was very sickly and physically weak and uh, suffered a great deal from asthma. Asthma? Yes, and because of that, I could attend school with the other children, and I had to be tutored. You sound something like the original 99-pound weakling, Mr. President. <laughs> <laughs> I say that. Well, my father told me if I wanted a strong, healthy body, I'd have to make my own. Mm -hmm. So from that point on, I became very enthused in athletics, riding, hiking, boxing, wrestling, you know, anything to build up my stamina and body. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a strong, healthy body, you can enjoy life and live every moment of it to the utmost. That's yes. true. Very Speaking true. of that sort of thing, Mr. President, how did you happen to form the famous uh, Rough Riders who fought in the uh, war between Spain and the United States? Yes, well, the Rough Riders were formed by Leonard Wood and myself. Oh, it's the Fort Leonard Woods, named after him, isn't it? Yes, obviously. <laughs> now, officially, they were called the first volunteer United States Cavalry. Mm -hmm. They were all hand-picked men. They were crack shots and crack riders with great fighting spirit. Mm -hmm. They came from all walks of life, you know. We had polo players in the main line in Philadelphia and cowboys from the West and gamblers and poker players, all levels of society banded together for a common cause. Well, they were great fighting men, and some of them remained my friends for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. When you were a child, Mr. Roosevelt, did you, did you have a dream of growing up to be president? <laughs> no, no, no. When I was a boy, I became extremely interested in natural science, uh, wildlife, birds, and so on. I even had some of my specimens in the Museum of Natural History in New York City when uh, I was only 11 years old. Remarkable. <laughs> yes, I thought so. <laughs> anyway, my ambition uh, then was to be a natural scientist, but by the time I got to college, I realized that was rather self-limiting, so uh, I switched to the law. And after my graduation, I suppose I had a natural affinity for political life because I was elected assemblyman and served in the New York State Legislature. But uh, what about Tom Paine's question, Mr. President? Oh, yes. Well, I suppose I always had the ambition to be president, but I never really thought about it. 
I remember one day being visited by Jacob Reese, a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a rumor about my running for the presidency. And he asked me outright, he said, do you want to be president? I said, don't you ever ask me that, because the moment you ask me that, I have to think about it. And if I think about it, I won't be able to do my present job as well as I should. And if I can't do my present job as well as I should, why, well, I shall never be considered for the presidency. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. President, uh, at this pleasant moment, if you'll forgive me, sir, for yes. bringing up a, a question that might be awkward and difficult, some historians have said that you acted like an imperialist in the manner in which you uh, achieved the completion of the Panama Canal. Would you agree, sir? Absolutely not. I simply had the foresight to know that this nation could no longer entertain a policy of isolation. Now, after the Civil War, we had begun to grow, and we were ready to take our place among the nations of the world. Mm -hmm. And if we were to maintain this position, it was an absolute necessity that we have access to both the Atlantic and the Pacific Oceans to the east and west coast of this United States. Mr. President, I don't see why you're so defensive on this point. What's wrong with imperialism? There's no real equality in this world amongst men or nations, and it's only common sense that the strong should rule the weak. I see, but uh, Your Majesty, I'm afraid the United States in recent years has not taken quite the same point of view on that subject. No. Now, in your time, might was right. Yes. And in later centuries in Europe, countries such as England, France, Spain, Germany, had carved out enormous territories for themselves all over the world. Exactly. Yes. But you see, we Americans do not feel... Oh, just one minute, sir. Mr. Payne, yes. didn't your country consist originally of 13 small colonies? Did indeed, Your Majesty. And have I been rightly informed that you have since that time, by war or other means, taken over territories that once belonged to the Indians, to Spain, Great Britain, France, Mexico, to Russia. Yes, that's true. And doesn't the American Empire extend this very day to such far-flung outposts as Alaska and the Hawaiian Islands? Yes, but you see, Your Majesty... Well, Mexico. then I say bully for you. <laughs> you have acquired an enormous empire and you should be proud of it. But the crucial factor here is, Your Majesty, we do not seek dominion over unwilling people. Why not? Oh. Uh, Mr. President, were the American Indians ever asked if they wanted to be part of your empire? Of course. <laughs> and why should they be? Why, my people were proud of the Egyptian empire, and the Romans were proud of their empire, old oh, gentlemen. My advice to Americans would be to think of yourselves as world citizens rather than provincials. What do you mean by that, Your Majesty? Well, Mr. Allen, the American empire is just about as large as the old Roman empire, only you tend to look inward. Whereas the Romans look outward to the whole world. But empire building is not as popular as it once was. Oh, come, come, Mr. President. It was probably never popular, and certainly not with the conquered peoples. But it did bring civilization to savage and ignorant tribes, now, did it not? Mm. Yes, well, <clears throat> to return to the question of Panama. <laughs> now, in case of war, we had to have fast access to either ocean, and this could be accomplished only by a pass through the Isthmus of Panama. In addition, this pass or canal had to be fortified by us to prevent, in time of war, access by enemy fleets. Mm -hmm. Now, this was my main reason for insisting upon the completion of the Panama Canal. Uh, Mr. President, if you'll permit me, I think Mr. Allen's original question was a moral one about the methods of gaining control in Panama. <laughs> now, Father, there are many stories about how that was accomplished, but let me give you the facts. Now, we had negotiated, but not ratified, a treaty with Colombia, which was occupying Panama at the time, against the wishes of the people of Panama. Mm. Now, if the Latin Americans wish to talk about imperialism and conquest, let them first talk about their attacks upon each other. Now, this treaty called for the use of land to build a canal in exchange for $10 million and $250,000 a year for the next nine years. Now, Colombia did not ratify this treaty. They thought they could get much more money from us or from the French, who had the French Panama Company there at the time. Mm -hmm. So, you see, I had five choices to make. What were they, sir? Well, number one, I could pay more money to Colombia, but I've always had a great distaste for blackmail. Number two, I could delay building the canal until we reached a new agreement with Colombia. Number three, I could abandon Panama for Nicaragua. But you see, studies showed that Panama was the better site. Number four, I could occupy Panama by force. And uh, number five, I could await a revolution in Panama. And which of the five did you choose, sir? Well, I chose the last option, Mr. Allen, because of information given to me by Mr. Bonavarilla, who was an engineer with the French Panama Company there. And he told me that the people of Panama were on the verge of revolting against the Colombian repression, and it would only be a matter of days. And you see, I saw here the answer to my problem. If the revolt were successful, we would then recognize the Republic of Panama and negotiate a treaty with them for the land which would be called the Canal Zone. Mm -hmm. Well, 
by George, <laughs> the revolt did take place. Well, thank you for that account, sir. Yes, but I gave no aid whatsoever to the revolutionaries. Oh, well, now, Mr. President, you did send gunboats down there, didn't you? Uh -huh. Yes, to protect American nationals uh -huh. and to prevent the Colombian troops from landing. Uh -huh. Nice. Yes. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, Mr. President, uh, again, if you'll forgive me for uh, bringing up a, a difficult question, you also have the reputation of being against big business. Poppycock. <laughs> I was not against big business. Only it's abuse by selfish individuals. Uh, are you talking about moral offenses? Absolutely. There was a definite need for the regulation of giant corporations by the, the government in the interest of the public. Now, you and I must obey the law. Why should big business be an exception? Mm -hmm. Corporations, corporations should have such regulations over them as to guarantee that their activity be exercised only in ways beneficial to the public. Now, to prevent abuses, the regulation of a corporation by the government is no more a move against liberty than putting a stop to crime or violence is a move against liberty. <laughs> now, of course, of course, these regulations should take place under the leadership of responsible men who are anxious to conserve the just rights of property. Of property, yes. 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 But, of course, you must remember that human rights are paramount in a republic such as ours. <laughs> Power power must be exercised over corporations. For unless they are controlled by the government, then they themselves will completely control the government. Very interesting, uh, Sue. That sounds remarkably like President Eisenhower's warning about the military-industrial complex. Oh, is that right? Yes, yes, sir. Well, I must insist, Mr. Allen. Her Majesty was going to tell us about her uh, relationship uh, with Mark Anthony. Oh, yes. Uh, very well. <coughs> um, Father, would you have any objection to hearing the details? Oh, not at all, Mr. Allen. You see, Her Majesty died just a few years before she could have heard the message of Christ. Even the Old Testament was unknown to her. We cannot therefore hold her to account on standards concerning which she knew nothing. <laughs> and remember, Aquinas, her conduct was no worse than that of generations of Christian kings and queens who gave lip service to your call, but were rarely, apparently, guided by it in their own personal lives. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, Your Majesty. How did Mark Antony come into your life? Well, gentlemen, I met him first when I was very young and I was living in Rome with Caesar. Because, as you probably remember, when Caesar was killed, there was a great struggle for power. And one group was led by Octavian, who was the grandnephew and legal heir of Caesar. Mark Antony led the other group. Mm. He was a powerful general, and when he saw that Octavian was only a boy and an invalid at that, he refused to give up the power he had taken upon himself. So what sort of a fellow was Mark Antony? Oh, he was, as you might say, really something. <laughs> <laughs> Big, handsome, like a Hercules. And when he came to meet me in Tarsus... Oh, yes, Tarsus, the home of St. Paul. <laughs> I arrived in my most luxurious galley. It had purple sails and oars of silver, because, you see, Antony had sent an ambassador to Egypt inviting me to meet him in Tarsus. Well, I met him. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, to paraphrase Caesar, you came, you saw, you conquered! I did indeed, sir! <laughs> Uh, was it purely a matter of love on your part, Your Majesty? Oh, of course not. Uh, I dazzled him with the wealth and luxury that I displayed because I wanted to convince him that all the riches of Egypt could be his if he would only share his power with me. Mm. Well, he forgot about his duties and uh, decided to spend the winter in Alexandria with me. What was Alexandria like in those days, Your uh, Majesty? Mr. President, to me, it was always the most exciting city in the ancient oh. world. It was rather like your New York or London, Rome, Paris. Only all rolled together. It was mm. really glorious. But the following spring, Antony had to return to his duties, and it was four years before I saw him again. It was four years, too, before he saw the twins. Twins? Yes, the boy and girl I bore him. Mm. We named the boy Alexander for the sun and the girl Cleopatra for the moon. Mm. Now, let me see if I have this straight. You were Antony's last wife? Oh, no. No, no. He later married the sister of my enemy, Octavian. Mm. Her name was Octavia. Did that make you jealous? Oh, mercy, no. Not at all. <laughs> that marriage was largely one of political convenience, and although he married Octavia, I was always the one he loved. I see. And when he returned to me some four years later, he told me that he planned to conquer Parthia. Of course, I was happy to furnish him with the golden supplies that he needed, and 
I went as far as the Euphrates River to see him off. That military campaign turned out to be a disaster, didn't it? Yes, it did, Mr. President. Things went from bad to worse. Antony was furious because Octavian had attacked me and he sent a bill of divorcement to his wife in Rome. Well, of course, that lost him many friends in Rome, as you can imagine. Then Octavian talked the Roman Senate into declaring war on me. Hmm. What did Antony do about that? Well, he had no recourse but to defend me against the forces of Rome. It was to be our undoing. When disaster piled upon disaster, Antony misunderstood a message that I was thinking of killing myself. He thought I'd already done so and plunged a sword into his side. When he regained consciousness and found that I was still alive, he begged to be carried to me. His stretcher had to be lifted up the front of the mausoleum wall behind which I was protected. And a few minutes later, he died in my arms. Octavian entered the city and captured it. He promised to treat me honorably, but I knew that he was lying because I had learned that he secretly planned to take me back to Rome and display me as a captive. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have none of it. I begged permission to visit Antony's tomb. And I bent down and kissed the cold marble that covered him. And I wept for hours at his loss. I then dressed myself in my most beautiful gown. And these same jewels that you so admired, sir. I ordered my quarters to be prepared as if for a feast. And with a very small poisonous snake ended my life. What happened to your children? Well, fortunately, Father, my children by Antony were spared. They were taken back to Rome and made welcome by Antony's former wife, Octavia. If you'd been in her place, Your Majesty. Yes. Do you think you would have been noble enough to do the same? Absolutely not. Hmm. What about little Caesar, your son by Julius Caesar? He was executed, Mr. President. Really? Yeah. It was a great tragedy that my own death spared my witnessing. Just think of it, gentlemen. That child was the last of the Ptolemy rulers of Egypt and the only son that Julius Caesar ever had. But Octavian had at last triumphed and he ruled Rome alone as Augustus Caesar. Thank you, Your Majesty. <coughs> Uh, remarkable story, yes, isn't it, gentlemen? Yes, yes, yes. Well, now, Mr. Payne, yes. uh, during your earlier visit here, sir, uh, you had started to tell us uh, something of the causes that led uh, to the American Revolution. Well, sir, part of the problem was simply a battle over land speculation. Oh? Same sort of thing that's not unknown to you people here in California. <laughs> Could you explain that, sir? Yes. Do you have a map here? But yes, over in the map ah. case. Well, so you see, after France was defeated on the North American continent, well, this left her Indian allies, such as the Ottawa tribe, led by Chief Pontiac, at the mercy of the British colonists, who began to encroach on the Indians' territories. Now, approximately when was that? Well, in 1763, Pontiac organized a counterattack. Now, this may surprise you, but some of the colonists did not even rise to their own defense, but left it to the King's royal troops to put down the uprising. Hmm. Also, I understand, Mr. Payne, the British were very eager to keep the loyalty of the former French colonists of the colony of Quebec as a counterweight to the rebelliousness that was beginning to grow in the other colonies. That's quite right, Mr. Roosevelt. In fact, partly to prevent any further such trouble, or so he thought, George III issued his royal proclamation of October of 1763. And what did he proclaim? that all the territory between the Allegheny Mountains and the Mississippi River, from Quebec all the way down to Florida, would no longer have any settlement or purchases by the colonists. Uh, did the colonists abide by the proclamation, Mr. Payne? They did not, sir. On the contrary, a, a huge army of over 30,000 settlers crossed the Allegheny Mountains and took such land as they could hold. Hmm. In fact, some of my colleagues, Washington, Franklin, Patrick Henry, to name but a few, uh, organized land companies. Land companies? To sell land to these newcomers. Hmm. So, uh, you can see right from the beginning, you Americans uh, 
I was specialist in the real estate business. <laughs> well, things went from bad to worse, and in 1774, England passed the Quebec Act. Now, this act stipulated that the entire territory north of the Ohio River would be annexed to the old province of Quebec. Now, this was supposed to put an end to the squabbling between Pennsylvania, Virginia, and some of the other colonies with uh, regards to the land in question. And did it do that? It did not, sir. In fact, partly out of anger, Virginia issued a call to the First Continental Congress, which met, as you may recall, in Philadelphia in 1774. Yes. Now, was that Congress called specifically to discuss rebellion? Oh, no, sir. It was motivated largely by love of liberty and by exasperation with the increasing short-sightedness of George III and his parliament. Mm. But wasn't taxation also an important issue? Oh, indeed, sir. A very important issue. You see, the Seven Years' War against France and Austria had been very costly to England. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, the expense of administering the new American colony was uh, uh, exorbitant, enormous. Yes. So, um, partly to defray these costs, England issued a series of taxes and duties on sugar, on paper, on lead, and tea, and all sorts of things. We did not take very kindly to these measures. We hated even more the snooping customs agents who became completely intolerable in their attempts to ensure collection. I see. And just when was it, sir, that violence first broke out? That would be in 1768, yes, when an American mob attacked British customs agents who were trying to collect duties from John Hancock's ship, the Liberty. Well, the rioting naturally made the British bring in more troops. There was a great deal of talk about law and order at that time, as I recall. <laughs> <laughs> well, for about a year and a half, an uneasy peace was maintained in the area, and then in March of 1770, some Americans threw just snowballs at the British Redcoats, Ooh. whose officers responded with an order to fire on the attackers. Good. It was not good, Your Majesty. Four Bostonians were killed. There was no further open rebellion until 1773. Yes, that was the year in which the Boston Tea Party took place, as you may recall. Oh, yes. What was the Boston Tea Party all about, anyway? Well, I said it was chiefly a business dispute. You see, the British Parliament had given the East India Company a monopoly on the tea trade in America. Well, naturally, the American tea dealers um, were not very happy about this. The company did not even employ local sales agents so that the Americans were even deprived of sales commission. Mm. So the tea of the East India Company was dumped into Boston Harbor. Mm. Fortunately, from the point of view of us revolutionaries, the British Parliament again overreacted. They passed what were called the Coercive Acts. And we called them the Intolerable Acts. They called for the closing of the port of Boston, the harboring of British troops in American colonists' homes, and the shipment of the worst offenders back to England for trial. Well, I should think so. Hearing of the growing troubles, England appointed General Gage as governor of Massachusetts. He quartered his troops up in Boston. Well, it was about that time that John Hancock and others started to organize resistance. Ammunition dumps were set up outside of Boston. What did General Gage do about that? He sent a detachment of troops to try to confiscate the arms. Hmm. And on 17 April, 1775, no, it was 18 April, 1775, Paul Revere heard of the attack, the approach of the British, and roused the Minutemen to stand against their invaders at Lexington. Eight Americans were killed. The British proceeded on to Concord, where, as you've been told, the embattled farmers fired the shot heard round the world. Yes. Well, did the colonists unite in a great patriotic fervor once the war had started, sir? <laughs> sir, as to whether we were patriots or not depends on one's point of view. Oh? In a way, we were not patriots at all. We were the traitors, the revolutionaries, the subversives. We were the rebels against the mother country. Mm. Those who remained loyal to England considered themselves the patriots, but your question had to do with unity, no, yes. sir? No, there couldn't possibly be unity when there were so many different points of view among the colonists. Oh, I see. You see, as the long quarrel between Britain and the American colony states developed, two distinct parties emerged. What were they? One were the radicals. The radicals were strongly opposed to British government. The other was the conservatives. I see. Now, just who were the radicals? Uh, so the radicals were mainly lower class and middle class people by the... Uh, the conservatives were, for the most part, well-to-do, educated, and well, some of them aristocrats. Mm -hmm. In fact, this is interesting. 
If England were to have gone up in a puff of smoke overnight, the aristocrats of America would still have been opposed to the common people. The common people were beginning to rise up. The county of Georgia, for example, was much more in favor of England, had very little interest in the revolution. In fact, she did not even send representatives to the First Continental Congress. Is that right? Fortunately for the revolution, the Sons of Liberty, Sam Adams, myself, and other troublemakers, <laughs> well, we managed to intimidate uh, those who were a little less outspoken. But you must understand the revolutionary sentiment at that time was felt by, oh, I would say only about a third of the people in the colonies. Only a third? No, that's it. And another third were, uh, were against the revolution. Mm. And the remaining third were people who just did not want to get involved. Yes, we still have them with us. <laughs> yes, they exist in every age. Yes. <laughs> because of this, we might never have gained our independence. But enough for the folly of the British Parliament in over-responding to the situation. See, naturally, the more stupid and arrogant the British became, the more force they employed, the more these moves served to anger the colonists and therefore intended to unite them. I see. But if I may return to my earlier question, sir, once the uh, hostilities had broken out, was it all a, a noble campaign from that point on? <laughs> <laughs> sir, I am appalled at how little you modern Americans know about war, especially since you've had such experience with it. Yes. Yes, it is possible that noble considerations may lead to war. But once war starts, nobility of motive finds itself allied with expediency, which will in its turn enlist almost any vice to attain its end. Mm. You're quite right, Father. But the idea that the American colonist was almost totally heroic is completely without foundation. Now, sir, they realized that the British manpower was five times as great as, as that of the 13 colonies, and the Navy... The ships of the British Navy outnumbered ours 100 to 1. 100 to 1? Yeah. England was the richest country in the world at the time, and we were not even a nation. Nor were our fighting forces really prepared for war. Well, Mr. Payne, don't those very facts suggest that the American colonists must have been heroic fighters? I mean, to overcome such odds? No, it's only a relatively few, isn't it? As I look back, in fact, now, I realize that we quite possibly would have lost the Revolutionary War. Had it not been that Spain, France, and Holland came in on our side and went to war and declared war against England. Hmm. Well, that, of course, would be a help. But what about our great hero, George Washington? No, sir, George Washington was a great man, a great general, although he did make some mistakes. And we had several good commanders as well as a small and courageous professional army, but uh, I'm afraid the majority of the American fighting forces were undisciplined, untrained, and as often cowardly as not. Cowardly? Yes, sir. This is one of the important reasons I, I had to criticize the summer soldiers and the sunshine patriots. Mm. You see, so the militia and the volunteers had very little interest in war. They knew the wages were poor, the, the equipment was disgraceful, the, the uh, hospital equipment uh, and facilities were practically non-existent. Mm. And the British were trained professionals. Yes, but our men did enlist, Mr. Payne. Yes, but only for short periods of time, and some of them did not remain in the army for an extra ten minutes once their term of service had expired. Some even left their posts in the middle of battle, Mr. President. Well, at least the officers were a courageous and disciplined bunch. Sir, I'm ashamed of you. I thought you'd know better than that. George Washington in 1776, in speaking of his officers, said, and I quote, that except in a few instances, they are not worth the bread they eat. You know, an interesting um, uh, factor connected to your point, Mr. Payne, is that many Americans today who can trace uh, an ancestor back to uh, revolutionary times, trace their general ancestry back, that is, they often feel very proud if they can simply claim an ancestor who was just alive at the time of the Revolutionary <laughs> War. Oh, really? How amusing. <laughs> well, I repeat, the heroes on our side were very few, relatively speaking. Fortunately, in the long run, the few heroic officers and men greatly distinguished themselves. The British made many mistakes. Well, the task was extremely difficult. They were fighting a war thousands of miles away from their homeland. A difficulty with which I understand Americans have recently had some experience. Mm. Well, perhaps then, sir, you've put your finger on something here. Maybe the reason, or one reason anyway, that the Americans finally won out is that they were fighting in their homeland, where the local villagers and townspeople were glad to help them. <laughs> no, sir, that was not always the case. Most of you know today about the sufferings of Washington and his troops at Valley Forge, the winter of 1777-78. Yes. But apparently few of you know more about that battle than what you might learn from looking at a painting of Washington and his troops in the snow. After all, it was snowing throughout that area at that time. Why, why then would only Washington's troops be suffering? It's a good question. I don't know. What's the answer? Well, sir, partly 
The stupidity and the weakness of Congress in failing to provide them with their material needs, but another factor was the selfishness of the Pennsylvania farmer who refused to sell food to Washington's troops because all they had was paper money. Hmm. Instead, they sold it to the British troops because from them they received payment in good English gold. Hmm. Yes, disgraceful, Mr. Payne. Well, perhaps, Mr. Payne, now, you're just describing isolated incidents or a state of affairs that lasted for a very short time. No, indeed, sir. As late as 1780, Washington's troops were still without adequate food and clothing, and as, partly as a result, his men were not only, not only deserting, but some were going over to the enemy. To oh. the enemy? Yes. Incredible. It was about that time, by the way, the treason of Benedict Arnold was uncovered. Well, so now you can see why I was driven to write my crisis papers. Yes, as a matter of fact, I never completely understood it before. I felt it was terribly necessary to do something dramatic to keep up the fighting spirits of the colonists. I felt it was necessary to constantly remind them as to what they were fighting for. To remind them of, of ideas such as those contained in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. Oh, most impudent document. <laughs> Well, Your Majesty, to the extent that you uh, frown on ideas such as those found in the French Rights of Man, the American Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, I suppose you'll be gratified to learn that the freedoms those documents were intended to guarantee are apparently less popular today than they were 200 years ago. Yes, and with good reason. Your glorious freedom was an absurd experiment from the first to passing phase. You Americans today, it seems to me, take rather a narrow view of the Declaration. You see it in terms of vaguely admirable sentiments. The wording appears to you like the wording of a prayer that you mouth without even thinking of its meaning. But the real underlying historic significance of the Declaration was that it expressed a growing attitude among thoughtful men in many parts of the planet, a growing questioning of the divinity of kings and queens. Mm -hmm. It was written at a time when divinity itself was coming seriously into question, Father Aquinas. Well, if there were no divine daily personal ruler of the entire universe, how could human kings in any sense be divine? No, how could it be said that their right to rule came from a supreme being? Mr. Payne, even if there were no gods, we queens, kings, and emperors have a right to rule simply because we are superior. It's only common sense that the intelligent should rule the ignorant, but the strong should rule the weak. Well, since many of the crown heads of Europe were and had been for centuries personally monstrous... Some of them, sir. Many of them Some... drunkards, profligates, incompetents, nincompoops. Well, we were in 1776 beginning to get royalty into a rather sharp, realistic focus. Oh, were you? Yes, we were saying, in a word, to hell with kings. <laughs> Keep that in mind as you rethink these words. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. Oh, <laughs> they most certainly are not. Her Majesty is correct, oh. you know, in one sense. Which one, Father? Nature oh. itself exists in the form of a hierarchy, which means that all things are not e created equal. Some occupy positions of higher importance, others are inferior. For example, as for the human race itself, there are no two men or women that are equal in beauty, wisdom, strength or intelligence. There are many natural differences. Precisely. But all men are equal in the sight of God, Your Majesty, and therefore must be equal before the law. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Father. That they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. The shepherd, Mr. Payne, has never sought the consent of the sheep. Shepherds in the long run, Your Majesty, rob the sheep of their wool, kill them, and eat them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. But to continue, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new governments. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Oh my, what a pity, Mr. Payne, that your fine flowery words are motivated chiefly by the contempt in which you evidently hold royalty. You misunderstand my views, oh, Your no, Majesty. No, I do not. I'm not the personal enemy of kings or queens, especially one as beautiful as yourself. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> no, on the contrary, no man wishes more heartily than myself to see them all in a happy and an honorable state. <laughs> as private individuals. But I am the avowed, open, and intrepid enemy of the institution of the monarchy. It is against the hell of monarchy that I declared eternal war. I wish you personally, Your Majesty, the very best of good fortune. <laughs> your Majesty, what would have happened to Mr. Payne in your day if he had made or written such statements? executed. Really? Oh, he would have been beheaded, Mr. President. <laughs> Heresy and treason were never tolerated in my time, nor should they ever be. Instant apprehension and execution saved a great deal of time and energy, and useless debate such as this. It also helped to preserve and perpetuate the state because the Egyptian Empire did not last for so many thousands of years by tolerating troublemakers. Do you deny, Your Majesty, that common citizens have any rights whatsoever? They have such rights, sir, as wise rulers choose to grant them. If, if all rulers were wise, Your Majesty, there would be no need for revolution. <laughs> Outrageous! <laughs> Look about you in the world today, Mr. Payne, and see what your fine rhetoric about revolution has produced. Do you see universal peace? Do you see universal order? Do you see widespread respect for the basic virtues? How that there have been despots among the monarchy down through the ages is quite clear enough. But I do not see that uninformed mobs, call the majorities if you will, are any the better. Well, <coughs> to get back to your experiences during the uh, Revolutionary War, Mr. Yes, well, in 1776, as I considered myself a man of action, I resigned from the magazine and joined the army as what you might call a propaganda specialist. I marched with George Washington and his troops. Mr. Payne, uh, despite the problems they faced, were the American forces victorious from the start? Quite the contrary, Father. For seven agonizing years, the war dragged on. There was a time, Father, when an army of 20,000 withered away to a few hundred helpless, beaten men. By December of 1776, all seemed lost. It was as a result of these sufferings, Father, that I wrote the following words, which you may remember. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands with it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, yet we have this consolation with us, that the harder the conflict, the more glorious the triumph. But we obtain too cheap, we esteem too lightly. Uh, just, uh, what was the effect of these words, Mr. Payne? <laughs> I will not be falsely modest, sir. There was no other single factor that so electrified and revived the sagging spirits of the American army. The words are from a paper I called Crisis. It was read in the army camps, speakers repeated my words. The results were so beneficial that during the war I wrote a total of 13 crisis papers, one for each colony. And I suppose the writing of your patriotic books and pamphlets made you a rich man, did it, Mr. Payne? <sighs> On the contrary, Your Majesty, I was never anything but poor. At the time, my income from Congress was a mere $70 a month on which I could barely live. I refused during the battle to accept any royalties for my patriotic writings. It was not until 1780, at which time I began to think of writing a history of the revolution, that I felt justified in seeking monetary return for my writings. Now, you didn't spend the rest of your life in the United States, did you, sir? No, sir, I did not. In um, 1787, I returned to Europe. I intended to stay only for a year. I wanted to visit my parents, who were still alive at the time in England, and I wanted to revisit France. <laughs> time has a way of of surprising us, it was to be 15 long years before I returned to American shores. What kept you in Europe so long? 
Well, sir, I shortly found myself in the midst of the French Revolution. <laughs> <laughs> you just couldn't stay out of trouble, could you? <laughs> sir, do you have something to drink? Oh, certainly. <clears throat> in fact, pardon in recognition... Me, I beg your pardon. In recognition of my, my service, Lafayette himself gave me the enormous key to the Bastille, which I transmitted to George Washington. Mm -hmm. This is water. <laughs> oh, then the, uh, <laughs> the stories, sir, that you were a bit of a drinker are true, huh? Sir, I lived in an age when heavy drinking was common. In my time, I was considered a moderate drinker. I was never an alcoholic, as some of my, some of my critics have alleged. You ought to have taken better care of your health, sir. You ought not to have drunk at all. Uh, uh, pardon me, Mr. President, yes. but may I ask, how old were you when you died? Sixty, sir. Sixty. Mr. Payne lived to be seventy-two. Yes, mm -hmm. but I died... <laughs> But I died from hard work, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, to get back to the French Revolution. Yes. Uh, certainly you don't approve of everything done in its name, do you, Mr. Payne? Obviously not, Mr. President, <laughs> since I ended up in a French prison cell myself. Hmm. Then I considered my friends during the Revolution were defeated. Then came the reign of terror, the execution of the king, of Queen Marie Antoinette, and more might interest you to know, Your Majesty, that I tried to prevent the execution of the king. Did you? One of the saddest things about man is that he is so easily disposed to execute those of whom he disapproves. Yes. Well, now, Mr. Payne, everything we've learned about you so far uh, seems eminently admirable. You're obviously you. one of the heroes of the American Revolution. <clears throat> Your general good sense is certainly clear. Why then would uh, President Roosevelt and others be so critical of you in the past well, years? Well, that was for another one of the books he wrote, Mr. Allen. It was called The Age of Reason, and what a pity he wrote it. Mm. Have you ever read it? Well, no, but I've read commentaries on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it might interest you to know, Mr. President, that I wrote some of it in Luxembourg prison while expecting to be executed. I was reviled in my native land, England, imprisoned by the French, neglected by George Washington and the American government. Well, in such a state, a man might easily succumb to despair or perhaps even suicide. Instead, I wrote a portion of the Age of Reason to contemplate the wisdom and the, the power and the goodness of God in his works. One is pleased to know you finally found time for such a pursuit, Mr. Clare. <laughs> In 1794, when the terror abated, I was released from prison. I had spent almost a year behind the bars. When I was released, I wrote the second part of Age of Reason. Mm. Since you are not an atheist, Mr. Payne, just precisely what was your religion? It was a religion called deism, sir. The worship of the God has revealed in the heavens and in his works in nature. I believe there should be no middleman between God and man. Very interesting. <laughs> what obligations did your faith place upon you, Mr. Payne? <laughs> what a remarkably Catholic question, Father. <laughs> <laughs> My religious obligations under the God of deism consisted of loving mercy, doing justice, and making my fellow creatures happy. <laughs> Sounds all too easy to me. Mr. President, for your information, my faith was substantially shared by such great American heroes as Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, and other outstanding men of the time, not only in the United States, but in England and France as well. Then why didn't Washington and Jefferson and the rest get into the same trouble you did if they shared some of your views on religious matters? <laughs> well, sir, most of them followed Franklin's advice not to spit in the wind lest it blow back on their faces. <laughs> Oh, sir, I am not criticizing my colleagues, but I felt that I personally had to speak out rather than hide my true beliefs. I felt that all national institutions of churches, whether Jewish, Christian, Turkish, whatever, were no more than human inventions set up largely to terrify and enslave men and to assist in the monopolization of power and profit. <laughs> sir, but since you've raised the question, I quote directly from The Age of Reason. I do not mean by this declaration to condemn those who believe otherwise. They have the same right to their belief as I have to mine. But it is necessary to the happiness of man that he be mentally faithful to himself. Infidelity does not consist in believing or in disbelieving. It consists in professing to believe what he does not believe. Oh, yeah! 
It must come as a great surprise to you now, Mr. Payne, to know that the chief victim of your attacks upon the scriptures was a certain rigid form of literalist fundamentalism, and that today many of your criticisms of scriptures are accepted by millions of devout Christians. I can see that I would not have anticipated that result, Father, but to the extent that Christian belief has evolved and become more civilized over the last 200 years, I naturally approve of the changes that have taken place. <laughs> My own view, Mr. Payne, concerning your criticisms of the follies and crimes committed by Christians and other believers through the centuries, is that you have spoken much truth, but you have by no means given a balanced picture. If the churches were as truly as evil and misguided as you say, they would not have persisted so long. Nor would you find so many millions of people who are certain they have derived deep comfort and that their emotional needs have been met by their religious faith. It seems to me that your rightful claim to fame is in your capacity as the author of common sense and the rights of man rather than the age of reason. How, um, how was your life ended, Mr. Payne? <laughs> I spent the last few years of my life, Your Majesty, in a miserable rooming house at 309 Bleecker Street in New York City. I lived on the second floor. In 1809, I was moved as an invalid to 50 Grove Street and died shortly thereafter. Did you change any of your religious views on your deathbed, Mr. Payne? I consider that question insulting, Mr. President, although I'm sure that was not your intent. Oh, are you? <laughs> <laughs> the last few months I was troubled by a number of fanatics who forced their way into my quarters trying to get me to recant before, as they supposed, I should suffer the tortures of the damned. <laughs> I remember a peculiar woman came to see me purporting to bring a personal message from God. I said to her, my good woman, you are not sent with such a pertinent message. God would not in any event send a foolish, ugly old woman as yourself with his messages. Go on, slam the door behind you. <laughs> yes. You seem very proud of your accomplishments, Mr. Payne, and very certain in your views. Is there anything you regret about what you did or wrote? Oh, Father, of course. We all have our regrets, our sorrows. I regret that I was not a, like yourself, a saintly man. Oh, I led an essentially decent life, but... Father of kindness, I always felt it more easy to, to love mankind than individual human beings. All of us have suffered from that difficulty, Mr. Payne, and perhaps the saints most of all. I regret, too, that I was not able to be more charitable with those who attacked me. I would say my greatest failing, sir, was my inability to compromise. Mm -hmm. Probably if I had it to do all over again, I would behave the same. For surely, sir, you must know that few men have been so viciously and unfairly attacked, and that's chiefly by people who consider themselves Christians. Any vicious lie, any abuse, any slander was considered permissible as long as Tom Paine was the target. I was alleged to be a drunkard, an adulterer, a traitor, an atheist, and every one of those charges was false. Tell me, Father Aquinas, what significance do you attach to the, uh, to the nature of these attacks on me? Well, it seems to me, Mr. Payne, that your most violent critics were probably those least certain of their own faith. Because their faith was lightly held, of course they may not have realized it, you startled them by jarring their smug assumptions. This, of course, sent them into a great state of alarm and fear. It was their fear, I think, that created their hostility. Father Aquinas, uh, you dealt with a great many heretics and unbelievers in your day. Uh, were you always so kindly disposed to them as you think Mr. Payne's critics ought to have been to him? <laughs> a marvelous question, Mr. Payne. <laughs> Thank you. The answer, of course, is no. Oh, I confess I was driven to anger and deep resentment at what I consider the very dangerous heresies of my adversaries. But I like to think I counted their arguments in the spirit of Christian charity. And I think, at least in my writings, I was largely successful in that attempt. Yes, I believe you were, Father. Yes. I 
friends, we come to a very interesting point. Let us pause to consider it most carefully. Her Majesty has been frank enough to tell us that had I broadcast my views in her time, she would have put me to death. No doubt most painfully. The rest of us seated at this table, now think this through very carefully. The rest of us would seem to consider her intended conduct morally abominable. It was partly to prevent such abuses of kingly powers that the Enlightenment emerged out of European history. It was partly in protest of these crimes that the, the beautiful saga of the United States of America was acted out. Her Majesty's conduct then stands condemned in the public conscience. Of course it is, Payne, but just what are you getting at? That Father Aquinas here is guilty of the same crime of intention. What? Yes. He too justified burning heretics at the stake, beheading them, strangling them. Is this true, Father? Yes. Yes, that was my view at the time. Today, I might view the matter differently. Rightly or wrongly, you see, there were reasons for the resort to capital punishment centuries ago. There were few prisons. There was nothing like the legal machinery available today. Most people, I suppose, were assumed to be guilty until proven innocent. And death was a common daily occurrence from war, sickness, and pestilence. You see, everyone in the 13th century assumed it was permissible to execute those who'd harmed the body. But the heretic was, by definition, one who harmed the soul by preaching false doctrines. So it seemed reasonable to consign him, too, to the execution chamber. The man of each age can scarcely be more civilized than his culture permits. Mm -hmm. And for whatever the point is worth, I observe that many of the leaders in the campaign to abolish capital punishment today are themselves clergymen. I see, Father. But in pointing to my errors, Mr. Payne, I must observe that you have done nothing to cast doubt upon the truth of the Christian doctrine itself. My argument is not with Christ, Father, it is with Aquinas. Speak for yourself. I shall. But it is impossible to separate my philosophy from the truth that Christ came to teach us. For my whole work, my whole life was dedicated to explaining to men the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus, my friend, were wonderfully simple. Even children understand them. The same cannot be said of your works. Even the Franciscan theologian Dun Scotus said he could not understand some of your arguments. That does not prove that they were false. You are right, Father, it does not. Tell me, Father, it is said that you prefer to think of yourself not as a philosopher, but rather as a theologian. Is that correct? It is. I confess I do not like these words, theologian, theology. Its meaning is... Well, science, doctrine, or knowledge of God. Precisely. And I say, therefore, that it is the most presumptuous word in the human language. Yes, presumptuous. How dare man, little man, ignorant man, presume to speak of his theories about God as certain knowledge? They are only theories, sir. Indeed. Some speculation about God is theoretical, Mr. Payne. But theories, I repeat, are not necessarily false. And it is possible to speak of truthful knowledge of God. Such as? That God exists. For you. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. All right, Aquinas, you've got me there. I, too, believe that this visible world was made by a supreme power, and I, too, call that power God. There may even be a few other statements about God that I would agree with. Oh, I see, gentlemen. Truth, then, is simply what you two agree on. <laughs> <laughs> My point, Your Majesty, is that... <laughs> My point is that though there are a few statements about God that can truthfully be made, those statements are damned few in number, yet he has written books by the dozens and called it all theology. I say that is the height of presumption. You have certain gifts for presumption yourself, Mr. B. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, Your Majesty, if you'll forgive me, uh, perhaps we should change the subject. Uh, very little is ever settled by heated argument about religion. Yes, you're quite right, Mr. Allen. Quite right. We have just a few minutes left. Uh, Mr. Payne, Yes. Could you tell us, the audience, what do you feel is the most significant thought about the American Revolution that you could suggest today? The fact that it has not been completed. 
course, no revolution has ever been totally successful. Quite right. Revolution is a form of warfare. And since war is inevitably corrupting, it is one of the great tragedies of human experience that dangerous forces, as well as good, productive forces, are set loose by revolution. Yes. The French Revolution succumbed to the worst sort of folly, terror. It seems even after the stormiest waters subside, revolutions always lose much of the ground they had previously gained. Mm. <laughs> You know, when I walked this earth, I used to think, oh, how wonderful it would be if we could be rid of George III, William Pitt, Robespierre and others I regarded as evil. Perhaps then, the rest of man could more happily work out his destinies. But now I realize that the essential battleground is in the heart of every man. Each of us must resist apathy. Each of us must be on guard against our own prejudices. Each of us must refuse to be guided by our own selfish interest. Yes, Mr. Payne. The worst dangers in the world come not from men who are overwhelmingly evil. The worst work in the world is done by men who are good most of the time, but who turn away from the light and seek the darkness when they see some immediate material advantage in doing so. Well spoken, Father. Now, well Father spoken. Aquinas, I would like to... Your Majesty, I do hope you'll forgive me, but unfortunately we've run out of time. Uh, oh. However, I thank all of our uh, distinguished uh, guests, and I'm sure that uh, those of you watching will join me in hoping that all of them will uh, visit us quite soon again. was produced by KCET-TV, which is solely responsible for its content.